Hi, I'm Steve Stone. I'd like to talk to you about a new book called Decriminalizing Mental Illness that I did with Catherine Warburton. You know, for centuries, there has been a pendulum ticking. Lock them up, throw them out. Lock them up, throw them out. Institutionalize, deinstitutionalize, institutionalize, deinstitutionalize. So the last swing of the pendulum, which was last century, and even two centuries ago, put them in asylums. Seriously mentally ill people need to be institutionalized. Let's put them in asylums. And some of the earliest asylums, which were not overpopulated and were well resourced, were actually nice places became overcrowded over time because there weren't enough asylums, they weren't resourced well enough, so abuses occurred, and so the pendulum swung from institutionalization to deinstitutionalization, which was facilitated, of course, by the advent of antipsychotic drugs. So in the 19th century, you institutionalized until the middle of the 20th century, then in the 1960s, you began deinstitutionalizing people, but not giving them resources. No housing, no medications. So what happened? These people were on the streets and also not in good shape and usually not taking medicines. So what happened to them? They began to commit crimes, sometimes petty, sometimes violent. But because people didn't want mentally ill patients unmedicated on the streets, Let's lock them up again. So they went from deinstitutionalization back to reinstitutionalization. But you know where we put them? We didn't put them in asylums. We put them in jail. The biggest mental health uh, facilities in the world are number one, the Los Angeles County Jail. Number two, Rikers Island in New York Jail. And number three, Cook County Jail in Chicago. So we put people in jail. And until they commit really a bad crime, and then we put them in prison. So we've decided to re-institutionalize people by criminalizing mental illness. And it's really very sad. These are bad places to be in general. There's certainly no place to be as a psychiatric hospital. There's no, they're not a hospital, they're a jail. So uh, what's happened over the centuries is deinstitutionalize, reinstitutionalize. So now people say, let's throw them out of the jail. Let's put them on the streets again. Going, oh no. So we have created this notion of decriminalization. And in the book, we talk about that. And one of the big parts of that is the possibility of diversion. So our, our book talks not only about the problem, about the, the fact that this reinstitutionalization has occurred and people want to get them now out of jails and prisons. But the best way to do that is not just to throw them back on the street without resources. So diversion programs are to divert people away from the criminal justice system to decriminalize mental illness by giving the availability of medicines. And guess what? For the first time in my life participating in these programs, I wrote a very funny prescription for housing. So the idea is that you need to have housing along with medication, and this will bypass if you participate in the program, you're putting in a criminal justice system. So that's the general idea is to stop the pendulum swinging from deinstitutionalization to reinstitutionalization and now to get people into the treatment they need in a more humane and merciful way um, with housing and medication, but not in an institution and not on the streets either. Decriminalization programs have a carrot and a stick. While it's true that if you have not committed a crime, you have the right to refuse your medicine, you have the right to live on the street, and you have the right to have your freedom of your illness and to even smoke marijuana and make it worse if you want to, until you commit a crime. Now, once you committed a crime, you have lost your civil liberties in this uh, society we live in. And you can be forced to take medication. So that is the stick. The carrot is, do you want to take your medicines in prison or do you want to take your medicines in outpatient housing? And so if you don't take your medicines or you elope from the housing in those 
diversion programs, you're rearrested. And they come in front of the judge and say, are you going to take your medicine? Are you going to live in this place? And if the person does, they go back to that place. And if they don't, they go to prison. So uh, it is important to have some leverage on the patient to participate in the program. But you're right. You cannot um, really uh, force somebody to look after their best interests without there being criteria. And that would be that they have committed a crime and that they need to take the medicine for their ability to be well themselves. Otherwise, they are going to be violent. And the other thing is that society doesn't want these people out of locked bars unless they're safe. And that means taking medicines in most cases. So that's how the, the program works. And but it's funny enough to say, even though you've been arrested, some of the decriminalization programs work differently than uh, the old way. So, for example, if you uh, beat somebody up or you throw something at them or you steal something and you're arrested, normally what would happen is you'd be assessed of whether you can stand trial. Well, if you haven't taken medicines, you may be incompetent to stand trial, in which case you have to go to a state hospital to be restored, which means medication so that you can participate in your own defense. Once you're restored and you're competent to stand trial, you go to trial and then you're guilty, you go to prison, you're innocent, you leave and you just go back to where you came from, usually the street, or you're insane, which is very uncommon, maybe 4% of people, in which case you go back to a psychiatric hospital until you're no longer violent. So the, uh, the, the, the waterfront of all these things is that uh, you can divert from that. So when you get arrested in a diversion program, before you get uh, even restored to competence, you can go to outpatients to get restored. And then if you take your medicines and stay in the housing for sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's two or three years, you never go to trial. Your competence is restored, you're treated, you're housed, but you have no criminal record. Now, that's a lot easier to work in society with no criminal record. Some county mental health systems will not take care of anybody with a criminal record. And of course, if you want any form of employment or <clears throat> you know, uh, you know, kinds of uh, fitting into society, it's not good to be a convicted felon. So these programs uh, decriminalize mental illness and we think that it's the right thing to do and that it has a lot of potential. And let me tell you one thing that might just set you on your heels. Are you ready for this? Pop quiz. How much does it cost to put somebody in jail for a year and in prison for a year and in a mental institution for a year? We actually had an article, I was a co-author on it in this book. And the answer is $100,000 to $150,000 a year in jail $150,000 to $200,000 a year for per person in prison, and $250,000 to $300,000 a year. You'd hear that? $250,000 a year in a forensic hospital. And the pop quiz is, how much does it cost to give you housing and medication and support with diversion? And the answer is $57,000. So it makes a lot of sense. Not only is it more merciful, it avoids criminalization, it avoids felony convictions, it stops the courts from being clogged up and the jails from being clogged up and the prisons from being clogged up and even the mental hospitals from being clogged up. And it's cheaper. You can treat four or five people in diversion for everyone you put in a long-term psychiatric hospital. So we think this is common sense and it's the time is right to do it and to push on it and that's why we wrote the book. Well, our book, Decriminalizing Mental Illness, has a decided U U.S. focus, but both the uh, co-author and myself, Dr. Warburton and I, have traveled uh, to the U.K. to look at how they do things, and we have uh, used some of their, uh, their successes. The U.K. has a normally a, a, a very tiered system, so you've got high security, medium security, and low security, and these are patients 
depending upon their dangerousness and their seriousness, their underlying illness are treated and try to move them down from the highest down to the lowest. And then the, the low secure would be basically outpatients. So we've learned a lot from our UK colleagues. We also have um, uh, interactions that are quite close with Australian colleagues, with Irish colleagues, with Italian colleagues. And uh, one of the editorials written by uh, in, in this book is, was by a Vatican priest. So Father uh, Carrara is, Alberto Carrara is a PhD neuroscientist from Italy who then went into the priesthood and is interested in this project and in uh, mercy and uh, trying to do a third thing. There's a three-legged stool for decriminalization. First of all, it's medication. Second of all, it's housing. But third of all, it's meaning, to try to find some meaning for a person who has a serious illness and probably isn't going to work and might not get married and, uh, you know, have a lot of perhaps limitations for how their lives are going to live, but still find meaning in that. It doesn't mean you have to be religious, but some form of meaning. And in fact, the Vat he wrote a nice editorial about how uh, our mentally ill are the eternal migrants. What? They're migrating all the time. Usually migrants are what happened with wars. So you have the war in the Middle East. And so the Syrian refugee crisis came to Europe and, and Italy. That's one kind of a migrant. But mentally ill patients have been migrating for centuries. They've gone from families to asylums, to the street, to the jails, now back to the street, maybe to decriminalization if we're lucky. And so he looked at that, and so there's some Italian perspective on this. So we're looking uh, all over. So there, there is some enrichment of some of the materials in the book from other places. Um, and we're uh, certainly in our projects and in our uh, work uh, with the patients outside of the book, we're certainly looking at, at other uh, countries as well.